Well, let's go ahead and get into the word this morning. We have been in a series uh, two weeks in so far. We are in week three of our He is Faithful series. Do you believe it this morning? Amen. He is faithful. Oh, he was faithful last year. He was faithful 10 years ago. He was faithful 20 decades ago. He was faithful last century, a century ago. He's going to be faithful today. And I promise you, he's going to be faithful tomorrow as well. He is going to be faithful on Tuesday when it rolls over to March 1st. He's going to be faithful a few months from now. He's going to be faithful next year. He's going to be faithful in a decade. And should the Lord tarry, and there are still believers walking the earth in a century, he will still be faithful then as well. We have been looking at different attributes of his faithfulness the past few weeks. On our first week on this character study, we actually talked about his character as in whole. He is faithful to his character. He calls himself, I am that I am. Last week, we examined how he is faithful to his word. He is still speaking. This morning, we are going to look at how he is faithful to his intentions. He is faithful to what he sets out to do. We're going to be looking at a passage of scripture found in Exodus 9. I guarantee it, you are very familiar with this passage of scripture. Though you might not recognize it right off the bat, it actually picks up in the middle of an event going on in the people of Israel's life and in the nation of Egypt. It is what is known as the 10 plagues. And in the middle of all of that, or actually just past the middle point of the 10 plagues, our scripture picks up here. Starting in verse 13, It says, then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this purpose, that I may show you my power and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. This morning I want to talk to you about his determined intentions. Let's pray for his word today. Father, thank you for your bread of life that we can partake of today that fulfills every hunger, every urge, every desire if we allow it to. Lord, we ask that as you speak to us today that our hearts would be ready to receive, our minds would be open, our ears tuned in to your voice. Do not let us leave the same way in which we came, but let us be transformed by your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Have you ever had one of those days where nothing goes as it should? You know, Sister Debbie, I heard that every day. (laughs) Every day. You know, I was thinking about some random things that every now and then happen that just go against what it is we set out to do. Like when, when we want to get up at a certain time, let's just throw out a random obscure time, 6 a.m., and we, we got to get up at 6 a.m., something, there's a doctor's appointment, something going on in our life. And so we set the alarm and we go to bed, but what do you know? We wake up at 7.45 because we accidentally set it to 6 p.m. instead of 6 a.m. Have you ever been there? You set out to eat well. Oh, this is going to be the week I'm going to eat good. I, I'm not going to that bake sale. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give above and beyond my tithes and offerings, but I'm going to eat good. You do good on Sunday, get your vegetables, you eat your, drink your water, no fried food, no fast food. But then tomorrow morning, Monday morning, you go to work and what is there but a dozen donuts, just <laughs> beckoning, calling your name. What was the point of avoiding the bake sale? 
You set out to work a project. Oh, I'm going to set out. I'm going to work a project. I'm going to start, and I'm not going to stop until it's finished. And wouldn't you know, you set out to do something like that. And every single step of the way, there's going to be interruption after interruption after interruption. Has anybody been there before? Plan a trip. Plan a trip. Look forward to the trip. Save for the trip. Get to the day of, the week of, and then suddenly sickness starts to rear its ugly little head and everything gets turned around. I remember a few years back, it's been about eight years ago now, we were invited to a birthday party. We were invited to a party, not not a little kid birthday party, but an adult birthday party. I need to be careful how I say that. That sounds literally kind of shady. (laughs) A birthday party filled with grown-ups, let's say that, you know. Mature conversation, a nice restaurant. Got the sitter, got to go. We got to the restaurant. We were there just probably five minutes, and we got the phone call from the sitter. One of the kids had thrown up. Had to go early, and it was so frustrating because when you set out to do something and your intentions are interrupted, it is frustrating, isn't it? And when what you intend to do is delayed, those days are absolutely the worst. But I'm comforted in this thought this morning that God does not have those days. He is faithful to what he intends. How do we define or how do we identify God's intentions for our lives? I mean, is, it, is he intending our salvation? Absolutely. He intends for us to come to know him. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Is his intentions lined up with our provision that he wants to provide for his people? Absolutely it is. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9 says, God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. How about our happiness or our fulfillment? Is that his intentions, that we would live this life happy and fulfilled? Not perfect, but happy and fulfilled. Absolutely it is. John chapter 10, verse 10 says that I have come and that you may have life and have it to the full. You know, when looking at his intentions, there are quite numerous amounts that we could be looking at. In fact, we could spend this entire message looking at his different varying intentions for his people, have scriptural proof for each and every one of them because he is faithful to carry out what he sets out to do. However, in our text this morning, in Exodus chapter 9, we see a broader clarification of what his intentions are a clarification that embodies all of his intentions. Look at verse 16 again with me. He says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. This statement is spoken from God to Pharaoh through Moses via Aaron. And if that statement sounds any confusion or brings any confusion to your mind whatsoever, it probably should because it's kind of a convoluted situation. But it shows the extent to which God will carry out his intention. Nothing is going to stop him. Before this moment in Exodus chapter 9, Moses first approaches Pharaoh in Exodus 5. And he relays the demands that God gives him at the burning bush from chapter 3. He says this in Exodus 5 verse 1, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And then look how Pharaoh responds in verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and that Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. God's response to this statement, it's almost humorous if you allow just a little bit of humor to creep into the reading. Because what is he to do except to introduce himself to this hard-hearted man? What is there left to do 
In fact, God says to Moses in the very next chapter, Exodus 6, verse 1, he says he's going to ensure that both Moses and Pharaoh are both not only acquainted with who God is, but also what he is capable of. He says in verse 1 of chapter 6, Now you, being Moses, will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my might, my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. And he begins right away. He begins right away to show the might of his hand. In Exodus chapter 7, right away, Aaron's staff, it's thrown to the ground. It becomes a serpent. But uh, Pharaoh's magicians, they can do the exact same thing. And they all throw down their staffs and they become serpents as well. But God, he's not going to be shown up. God's going to show only what he can do because his purpose is that his power would be shown. And so Aaron's staff or Aaron's serpent, it consumes all the other serpents that were there on the ground. And it continues on if the plagues against Egypt Plagues that are meant to drive Pharaoh's actions to free the Hebrew people, but also plagues that are meant to introduce Pharaoh to this God that he does not know, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember the plagues. There's, there's 10 of them total. There's the first six. That there's the plague of blood where all the bodies of water in Egypt are turned into blood. There's the plague of frogs, where frogs come upon the land. It says frogs in their homes, frogs upon their beds, fro frogs in their ovens and in their kitchen utensils. Disgusting. Several years ago, I preached a message. I remember it because it was called, Why Not Now? And when Pharaoh pleaded to God or pleaded to Moses, remove these frogs, he doesn't say, right here, right now. When Moses asks them, when do you want them gone? He says, tomorrow remove them tomorrow. And when they are removed that day, they're not actually removed. They just die on the spot. And it says in Exodus that there are heaps of frogs that begin to reek in the land. There's the plague of gnats that come from the dust. There's a lot of dust in the desert of Egypt. I used to live on a shell rock road and there was dust everywhere. It was terrible. I hated living on a shell rock road. It'd be even worse if all that dust became gnats. The annoyance of it. There's the plague of flies, swarms of flies everywhere in the houses, kind of like the frogs outside, everywhere that they step. There's flies literally everywhere. The plague of the livestock, where all the livestock of the Egyptians perished, but the livestock and the animals of the Hebrew people, they're perfectly fine. The plague of boils, painful boils upon the people and animals in the land. Six tremendous plagues, all meant to show Pharaoh who he was and to have his name proclaimed. And when Pharaoh fails to live up to this, God says, I'm going to be faithful to my intentions. My power will be known. My name will be proclaimed. And God, he tells Pharaoh something kind of almost humorous again. He says, I've been reserved up until this point. I've been holding my hand back up until now, but not any longer. From here on out, you will experience the full force of my power. And thus comes then the plague of hail, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and the plague of death. Our heavenly and Father intends for his entire creation to see his power so that they will proclaim his name. But here's the beauty of our God. His power revealed shouldn't be a negative experience. It was Pharaoh's hard heart that caused the pain for Egypt. But for us who are willing to seek his power manifested in our life, for us who are willing to proclaim his name and have his name proclaimed through us, his intent in our lives is a beneficial thing, is a pleasurable event within us. Oh, that we would pursue his intentions being revealed in our lives, in our families.
This morning, I want to share with you three things to remember when seeking his intent to be fulfilled. First of all, when seeking his intent to be revealed in you, remember that behavior will not reshape his intent. There are people out there this morning. There are people out there in your circle of friends, in your family. There might even be some here today that they believe that there was a time when God wanted good things for you, but no longer. There are those that believe that they've made too many mistakes. There's those that believe that they've committed that one sin just too many times, that they've been lukewarm just a little too long, that they've sought their will over his too often. And the way that they have conducted their life has cost them. It has cost them his intent, his good intent. In fact, that his intent has been reshaped and that God no longer wants what is best for them. Let me tell you this morning, Sister Christy already kind of touched on this just a little bit today. I know Brother Chris already talked about it a little bit in their morning devotional this morning. This is a lie from the pit of hell this morning. This is what Satan is trying to whisper into the lives and into the ears of God's people. Because the enemy has intentions too. Wouldn't you know the enemy has an intent as well? His intent is to get you to doubt God's good intent for you. And the enemy doesn't care whether you follow him or not. All the enemy cares about is that you don't follow God. That's all that matters to them. So that if he can get you to doubt God's intent, it doesn't matter who you believe in. The enemy's intentions are summed up in a lot of different verses. Look at three of them here with me. John chapter 10, verse 10. We talked about the abundant and the fulfilling life that God wants us to have, and Jesus does. But before that, he says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Mark chapter 4, verse 15 says, Jesus speaking, he's talking about how the word is received. Jesus says, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So it's right on character for the enemy to whisper in my ear that God's intent is, has been changed. It's been reshaped when I've messed up too bad. That the power that is manifested in his grace and in his mercy in my life, that the power that is manifested in his loving kindness and his compassion, that somehow that they have lost their efficacy within me. When it comes to my life choices, though, I can be encouraged today because I'm in good company when it comes to people that were in the Bible. Oh, there are so many people in the Bible that messed up, and they messed up good. You know, Noah was a drunk. Isaac played favorites with his kids. Jacob, he was a deceiver and a manipulator. Moses killed a man before the burning bush. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson couldn't keep a promise. Gideon needed proof before he would act. David had an affair with a married woman and then killed her husband to cover it up. Solomon, he's an extreme polygamist. All these guys are into polygamy back then, but Solomon, he's into it to the extreme. Elijah, he's fearful and suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Peter had a temper and denied Christ. Matthew, the writer of the gospel, one of Jesus' disciples, he's a tax collector, so most likely a liar. Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection, and Paul hunted down Christians before he came to Christ. Yet God's intent for every single one of these people was never reshaped. Every single one of these individuals were able to see God's power revealed in incredible ways. Be encouraged today. There is nothing. Say that with me today. There is nothing 
There is nothing that I will do that will reshape or hinder his intentions for me. He intends for his power to be experienced firsthand. He intends for me to know his power intimately. He intends for me to seek his power regularly. He intends for me to be known by his power working through me. How do I know he is faithful to his intentions? Because when his power is revealed, my behavior is reshaped. My conduct will not reshape his intent, but his intent will reshape my conduct. I don't have to be a certain way to seek him. Seeking him transforms me to who he wants me to be. You know, I am would be no different than Allah if his intention was continually shaped by my actions. There would be no difference whatsoever. He couldn't be sought after or longed for, but he is not. He is faithful to his intentions. Nothing I do will change that. Secondly, this morning, when seeking his intentions to be revealed, remember that flaws do not limit his intent. You know, like those who believe that God can't use them because his intent has been reshaped, there are those that out there, out there that believe that God won't use them because of a specific flaw. A flaw that has been limiting my ability is limiting his intent to be revealed within me. A flaw of me being too fearful. A flaw of me being too young. A flaw of me being too old. A flaw of me being uneducated or or not knowing what the answer is or don't know how to do it. The flaw of not having enough words or the flaw of having too many words the flaw of not being good with people, the flaw of of feeling all alone, the flaw of, oh, I can't afford it, or the other 20 million other flaws that we put as an excuse before God. You know, when Moses was at the burning bush before any of this started to happen in Exodus chapter nine, and God starts to roll out to him what he was about ready to ask him to do, Moses came up with on the spot five things five reasons why it wasn't going to work out. Right on the, it's like he had them ready to go. <laughs> kind of saw what God was getting ready to do and just, okay, had that Rolodex of a list right there in his mind. First one, oh, I'm not inadequate for the task. He tells God in Exodus chapter three, verse 11, he says to God, who am I that I should go up to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You know what? Absolutely, he's inadequate for the task. Who wouldn't be inadequate for the task? There is none of us that would be, but God was going to be with him, and that's exactly what God told him in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. He says, I will be with you. And when God is with you, what else could you possibly need? He also comes up with this excuse that I don't know enough. He says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God gave him the answer to that question directly. We talked about it a few weeks ago. He says in Exodus chapter 3, I am who I am. That is who you are to tell them sent you. Tell them I am has sent you to them. You know, tests are easy when you have all the answers. And I remember another verse in the Bible. It's in John where Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come and he was going to provide an answer when we needed it the most. When we wouldn't have what it is to say in our minds or in our hearts, Holy Spirit would reveal at the proper time. He also comes up with this excuse that people won't take me seriously. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, he says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? 
Of course, God had already told him before he even said this that the people were going to listen to him. God's already covered this. But what kind of people would we be if we didn't refute what God already said, right? We didn't come up with another excuse on top of that to rebut it. And so God, he gives him three incredible miracles to perform. Go ahead and throw your staff on the ground. It'll become a serpent. Stick your clean, healthy hand into your cloak. Remove it. It'll be all leprous and diseased. And then stick it back in. And when you pull it back out, it'll be restored and completely healthy again. You know, when people are doing these kinds of things, people listen. People will take you seriously when you have God working incredible miracles on your behalf. He says that I'm no good with words in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. He says, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and tongue. This line always makes me smirk just a little bit because he's there at the burning bush. What could have been like 15 minutes at most? And he's like, I haven't been good in the past or in the past 15 minutes since we've been talking. Nothing's changed, God. And yet God says, okay, I'll send somebody else with you and they'll be your voice. And then the fifth excuse isn't really even an excuse, but it just really speaks to the heart of the matter for each and every one of us when it comes to how we let our flaws limit his intent. He just says, basically, I'm not willing. He says, Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, Lord, please send someone else. I don't want to go. You know, that's probably the most dangerous of all of our excuses is our heart in the matter. Inadequacy will not limit his intentions. Inadequacy will liberate his intentions in us. Inadequacy is fertile ground for his intentions to thrive in. Scripture describes what happens when God's power is added to my lack. In uh, 2 Corinthians, I always get the mix up. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 He says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He is faithful to his intentions. His power will be revealed. It will be revealed in flawed people like you and me. People that the world writes off. I'm so amazed at what God allows me to be able to do he has allowed me and enabled me to do. Where people would write me off because of my inadequacy, because of my training, because of whatever reasons. I'm so amazed. One of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God says through Paul to the Corinthian church, he says, think of what you were When you were called, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world to uh, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Oh, I'm not capable he's capable. I don't have all the answers, but he has the answer that I need. I'm not the ideal choice for anything that he has enabled me to do. But his power revealed, his name proclaimed in my life. He is still faithful to his intentions. Finally, this morning, when seeking his intentions to be revealed, remember that interference cannot sideline his intent. There's a third kind of people in the world, and it's kind of crazy to think that there's this kind of person in the world, but there are. There are those in the world that believe that God will change his plans just because they object. 
You don't believe me? They're out there. They might not profess it that way, but they sure do live that way. They believe that with enough persistence, they'll wear God down. They'll believe that if they hold out long enough, he'll just give up and forget. They believe that if they resist, eventually he'll just move on. Pharaoh was this kind of guy. And God recognized this about Pharaoh. And so when Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the same thing, God begins to show Pharaoh what would be no match. That he is going to stand alone. He's going to stand apart. Pharaoh, he's seen and experienced what no one else ever has. And over the course of these six plagues, how could he and his officials not believe that God is in it? But yet Pharaoh still believes that he can hold out longer than what God can dish out. God tells him in Exodus chapter 9, verse 17, you still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Because Pharaoh, he's still holding out, believing that if he just waits long enough, God's going to get bored, he's going to give up, he's going to move on, and the labor force that his country has been dependent upon is going to continue to be able to be exploited. Pharaoh believes that God has met his match in him, but Pharaoh learns that he has met his match in God. And when it comes to God's intent for our lives, it's not about what I believe, it's about what I learn. What I believe has the possibility of being wrong, of being misunderstood, of being flawed, of being inconsistent, of being foolish, But when God's intent is learned, I learn along with it. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His sovereignty is stronger than my ability. His intent will not be defeated, will not be diverted, will not be delayed. I can argue I can resist. I can protest every step of the way and I will only find that I'm finding myself fighting against God. There's a guy in the New Testament in Acts chapter five. His name is Gamaliel. Gamaliel, he's a a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. And he kind of says the exact same thing to the leaders of the temple. Because at this point in church history, something as different is happening in Jerusalem. And not everyone is happy about it. Not everyone is thrilled about the lives being changed, people being healed. This problem that was called Jesus was supposed to be done and over with. He's supposed to be dead and his cause is supposed to be stopped. But now what was a minor inconvenience several weeks, several months before is now just this incredible movement where people are being saved. Dozens have turned into thousands and it's being the whole status quo is being turned upside down. The apostles, they're arrested because of this. They're thrown in prison and miraculously are set free in the middle of the night. The next day, they're rearrested and they're instead of put in prison, they're taken right before the high priest and set and interrogated. And when they are giving answers he doesn't approve of, the high priest wants to put these men to death. And this is when Gamaliel, this teacher of the law, this well-respected, Respected man that is honored by all the people. He stands up and he says, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. If their purpose or if activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God because he is faithful to his intentions. Whether you decide to relentlessly pursue him or persistently resist him, his power will be made known. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. This is 
his intent. I am is driven by it. He will not be deterred from it. You can fight it, you can argue it, you can resist it, but you cannot defeat it. He is faithful to his intentions. You know, like we said earlier, there's many specific things that we can roll into what is his intent for our lives. There are things that we want to seek his face for as his intent, his his provision and his healing in our life, his hope and his restoration of our lives. And these are all worthwhile, incredible things to see his intent revealed. First Peter chapter five says, give all of your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. However, this week, I wonder how our lives might be affected if instead of seeking his intentions in something specific, we examine and we seek his intent in something just a little bit more basic, a little bit more fundamental, just a little broader, that his power would be revealed, that his name would be proclaimed. It says in our key verse, Exodus 9, 16, that for this purpose I have raised you up. Other translations or the direct meaning of it, what he's talking to Pharaoh, he says, for this purpose I have allowed you to survive. I'm sure there was plenty already dead in Egypt up to this point in time, six plagues in, but for this purpose I have allowed you to not be one of them so that your pow- my power would be revealed and you would see it and my name would be proclaimed. And I wonder this week, how many of us are in this room that he is saying this to you? That you're here this far in. You have seen your life and the way it could have ended at a moment's notice, but I have allowed you to make it to February the 27th, 2022, when the world is on the brink of war when the status quo of our comfort is being threatened every single day. But yet, I have raised you up so that you would have my power revealed, that you would proclaim my name. This morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place today.